Good evening, everyone. So great to see all of you. The microphone works. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. I'm Mark Stoker Hunter, historian for the History Center. We're so excited to have you here at our special event tonight. Uh, this is the debut event for us. Oral History is live, but none other than George Henry. And we want to first uh, thank Mike and uh, Esther Wilson for making this uh, possible this evening. I'm going to do that statement that they always do when you go to the movie theater. Make sure you check your cell phone, smartphone, anything you have on you that might make some noise during the uh, program tonight. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, uh, this is an appropriate first subject. Uh, George and I had a wonderful experience getting to know each other when we put together uh, several books related to the History Center. And uh, George, and near and dear to my heart, no about that. And George seemed like a fitting uh, beginning to our Oral Histories Live series. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, connection with our current exhibit up on the third floor of the public library. Uh, 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 portraits are photographs by William Bayless, uh, one of the preeminent photographers in Cedar Rapids of Lincoln County history. So um, we are going to uh, talk with George. Our moderator tonight is Mr. Rob Fine who is a uh, marketing director at Hanshaw Auditorium and endlessly busy freelance writer. So we're going to hand over to Rob, and thank you again for coming, Rob. Thank you, Mark. This is a very loud microphone. Everybody can hear us OK, I'm guessing, yeah? yeah? All right. So my main job here tonight, as Jason Wright explained to me, was to keep George and Mark from coming to blows. <laughs> So that's why I'm situated where I am, and we'll, we'll do our best to, to see how that goes, all right? So we'll have time for questions from y'all uh, at the end of the evening tonight. So if you'll uh, be thinking of questions, uh, anything that I don't get to, uh, George would be happy to talk to you about. But let's jump in. George, are you ready? Oh, I guess so. I'm here. All right. <laughs> it's a good thing. We told people you would be here. Uh, well, let's start with the obvious thing. Tell us about how you got started as a photographer. What made you want to take pictures? Well, when I was, uh, I always had an interest in photography when I was young. Went off the, in World War II, came back, and went back to Coe. And anyway, when I was at Coe, uh, they needed a photographer for their newspaper and their yearbook, and I was there. And so consequently, I started doing that, graduated four years later, and uh, the, uh, I had now become the official photographer for Coe College, as well as a, went into it as a profession. And so 78 years from then, I quit. <laughs> it's good that you took your time. Yes. Make sure you were making the right decision. But, but anyway, I had a wonderful time there. I, I, you know, when I went to Coe to start with, they had no summer school or anything, so Co took summers off, and I took summers off, and had a chance to drive, drive and walk around the mountains out in the west, take, uh, go to the national parks, and take pictures, and, and uh, then I got involved in uh, the boating situation. Uh, was a white water boatman for 45 years, and enjoyed that, and got many pictures there, but I had time to explore the west, and. I had a tremendous amount of fun doing it, and I still enjoy doing things like that. All right, so your time at Co. it's a long time, George. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the, when we came to your studio the other day, you were telling us about some of the people you worked with who were important to you and helped your career and, and made sure you got some of these wonderful shots. So I'm interested in sort of the milieu of Coe College during your tenure there. Thank you for asking me that question. I worked with a wonderful person in charge of public relations at Coe College, Carolyn Smith. And uh, she was the, in charge of the public relations office. And I worked with her for 35 years on the campus. And because of her, I was able to get the event to the events at Co. Uh, she would call me up and say, can you be there at such and such a time? And I said, what day? And she'd say, G give me a day. And I said, why, sure. So anyway, Carolyn would tell me to be someplace. I went there to that place, took the pictures, things like Louis Armstrong and Martin Luther King and some of these people who 
uh, most people don't have to get a, get a chance to see. Well, I took pictures of them, of which I still have, by the way, and an exhibit around. But anyway, it's, I did the fun things at Co. met the celebrities, took pictures of the football team and the, and the golf team and the, all the teams and the people on them. And uh, so consequently, for 35 years, I, I, I did this. And then I guess they got get a little bit mixed up. They started having co start earlier and so forth. And so I had to give up something. So I gave up the pictures of co uh, as being the only photographer there. And anyway, uh, I've got a wonderful record of the co stuff. And I've got a wonderful record of a lot of other things that, that uh, I was going through some old negatives. And all of a sudden I looked at them. I, a friend of mine, Dick Clink, graduated from Co. It's the same I did, I did I ti same time I did. And anyway, he wanted to go out into the West and do a book on Monument Valley. At that time, nobody knew there was such a place as Monument Valley. And anyway, we found a map, a, a primitive map, out in California, at the Auto, Auto Club there, and uh, got hold of the uh, the map. And so we took off to go to Monument Valley. And anyway, we got there and here was a dirt road said, not advised in, in uh, rain. And so anyway, that's where we went and went out. And anyway, went into Monument Valley, which was an absolutely beautiful place. Un nobody, nobody had ever been there before, except Harry Goulding who homesteaded out there when it was uh, early, um, well, when the Indians were still roaming free in the buffalo and so forth. And anyway, uh, a homestead there. And during that time, he um, found, uh, was taking a few pictures of, of Monument Valley himself, and he said, you know, the movie companies ought to come out here and, and take pictures. And he had a few pictures, and he tucked on his arm and said, I'm going out and see whoever was one of the main producers out there of Westerns, said, I'm going out there and see that man. So we went in, got to California and went up to see the man. And the secretary said, I'm sorry, he's busy now. And he doesn't have any time for appointments today. And Harry said, well, that's all right. I got plenty of time. I'll sit and wait for him until he comes tomorrow. tomorrow. And if he doesn't come in today, I'll be here to meet him in the morning. So anyway, uh, he did come out, he was on his way home, and Harry said, I'd like, have you got time for a minute? And he kind of flashed a couple of his Monument Valley pictures, and uh, he, he saw them and said, my, this are beautiful, uh, come on into the office. And so they talked, and the uh, person said, said okay, um, I'm going to, I, we're going to move, take a, a movie out there, which is Stagecoach. And anyway, that's the first Western that was shot out there. And I also might add that this was shot in the summertime because the summertime is when you shoot pictures like this. And uh, there was an Indian out there, they called him Thatso. Uh, not very becoming for an Indian, but that's what they called him. And you said, well, you better employ Thatso too because he makes the weather out here. Well, you don't believe a thing like that anyway. But anyway, each, each night, uh, Harry had put in a, uh, the producer had put in a, a request for the type of weather they wanted the next day, and normally it would come up that way. And, and so and the, this guy came and said one night, but you didn't, give, you didn't send the report in, or what, what, do you, what did you want for tomorrow? He said, well, this is summer, you know, and he said, there's no way possible it could happen. But anyway, I'd like to have some snow. And he says, I'll see that, so I'm not sure whether he can handle that or not, because you're a little bit late on the, on the programming. Well, anyway, he and Harry Goulding were sleeping in the, in the cabin up there, and this uh, first producer re reached up and looked out the window. A light covering of snow was covered in Monument Valley. <laughs> From then on, the first person on the payroll 
when they shot some more movies out there was Fatso. <laughs> I think we could use him around here, to be honest. If he could help us with our weather lately. That I would knew we nice. need him out here, yes. Yes, absolutely. So, George, I want to back up just a little bit. Let's, you spent some time in the military during the war, during World War II. Tell, tell us about, you have a great story about ROTC at Co. And oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the, I think it's very interesting. When I went to Co. to start with, uh, everybody had to have two years to go because ROTC was compulsory. And in the ROTC was compulsory. We got our uniforms and we marched and we did the other things. And anyway, war came along then. And uh, I was talking to my commanding uh, officer there one day and I said, he asked me what I was going to do in the summer. And I said, well, I'm going up to Lake Okaboja and, and spend the summer up like, there up there like I always do. And he looked at me and said, you know you can't be in our advanced program unless you go to summer school. I said, gee, that's too bad. So my mother and I went, went to Des Moines. I enlisted in the Air Corps, took the summer off, and came back and <laughs> went into the service in the, in the Air Force. Summers off are important, right? You know, you, you want to take advantage of that when you can. Okay, so now you're, you're in the Air Corps. Tell us a little bit about your, your career in the war. Uh, I flew an airplane. <laughs> well, I was a pilot of a B-24 uh, bomber, and uh, we went out, we lived in little cement bases, 10 feet square or something like that, maybe a little bit bigger, I don't know the size, but you put a tent over the top of it or, and it would keep out the rain and the sun shine and everything else, but we were, uh, we, and we, our heat, and of course we arrived there, arrived on my birthday for my 23rd birthday, uh, after training all over the United States for a year, about a year and a half to get prepared for this moment. And anyway, we had a, it's a, uh, a stove out there that uh, would, you could, it was, you'd burn what was available, either 100 octane or diesel oil. Now there's some difference between the two of you might know. One's 100 octane and one is basically no octane. But anyway, we were burning diesel oil at the time. And anyway, uh, turned, turned the wick down at night and the, um, looked over about 10 minutes later and the uh, fire had gone out, but the wick was still burning. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. So I reached over to turn it off and the stove exploded on me. Just bur burnt my hand, didn't break the skin, but burnt my hand, like you put it in on some hot water, you know, and, and kind of scald it, but burn was there. Uh, uh, so in the morning, I, we went out to, to the white line because I was flying in the morning, got the, where you were gonna go to fly, and then went on sick call, and they took this new drug, sulfa, brand new then, one of the miracle drugs back then, and they spread it on my hand, wrapped my hand, put on my silk glove, and I, as this is, hey, this was in January, and for warmth and so forth, the gloves over, it was very difficult to fly. Flew, flew an eight-hour mission, came back, and I was curious to see how my hand was. Well, I got, when I got down on the ground, again, I took the glove off and took the bandage off and looked at it. There was no pain, no redness, no soreness in the hand. And I, it's one of those miracle things that they're just starting to learn about this, before penicillin and so forth. But anyway, the way it, but we had it, had it then and used it and it was a, a real, real treat to see something that, like that and coming on. Of course, since then we have all kinds of stuff, but back then it was a, it was a pioneering thing. Hmm. So then you come back to Co. And I came back to Co. And was the photography position? Did they create it for you? Was it a, a full-time gig to start? All they did was tell me when the when the people were coming to Co. And I would be there to take their picture and did take their pictures and uh, was able uh, to talk to them and so forth. And, and some marvelous people came to Cole, John Glenn and Andy Williams and uh, uh, Satchmo and some of these other people that don't usually get to have a chance to be with or talk with. And anyway, I had a chance to talk to them and so forth. And, and uh, uh, because I was, directed by Carolyn Schmidt to get to, <laughs> get to those things and had a wonderful time doing it and, uh, and kept doing it for 
very steadily for when I worked with Carolyn Stratt. Huh. And so I'm interested in the, the difference between taking pictures of the Co football team or the academic environment at Co or the architecture at Co and taking pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Louis Armstrong. Is, was there a different kind of energy involved in that? Was there a different kind of preparation? Slight different preparation, but not much. I just take a camera and go do it. Uh, <laughs> You're not making the moderator look very good, George. <laughs> but I appreciate your honesty. But anyway, when I'd come back in the, in the fall, in the football team were there, I'd take the individual pictures, I'd take the team pictures, and, uh, the, uh, and shortly after that, I was taking movies at the football, the cool football games, back when they had somebody quarterback like Shady Day and uh, Rosenberg, who Rosenberg supposedly never lost a yard and played fullback. But he also, they had a hidden ball trick that I mean, some of you people may have heard about it. Anyway, Shady Day would go back to pass and have the ball hidden so well, because Rosenberg would still be going for, fighting for every inch on the line. And uh, anyway, when they got him down, well, he didn't have the ball. The ball was back there with Shady Day throwing to a uh, pass receiver 20 or 30 yards down the, down the uh, field. And uh, I don't know how anybody ever heard of Fred Winters. Well, he, anyway, he was, he was a referee that was there. And so the, the team captain went and said, now don't call this play dead on the line because he's not going to have the ball. And Fred Winters said, you know, if I can't tell the difference between a fake and a, and a, and a play, he said, I, ret I will retire. Well, anyway, I went through the thing. Ray Rosenberg went through the line. He didn't have the ball. And anyway, when the ball was in the air, Fred Winter blew his whistle. <laughs> it had to be down. So anyway, it took the touchdown away from the goal. And the next play, Fizz Phillips was also a, a good runner there, took the ball and ran for a touchdown. And Fred Winter said to me, I'm never so glad to see, in my life to see a touchdown as <laughs> it was that one. <laughs> but he did retire at the end of the year, Fred Winter did. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Did, was he good on his word for retiring? All right, I, know, I actually, I know a football team about 30 miles that way who could maybe benefit from that play, so. Yes, uh, you'd have to, you'd have to have a guy that was unstoppable through the line. Fair enough. I, we don't have any around here. Uh, you're probably right about that. Okay, so we've made mention of some famous folk who have come to Co and other people that you've, you've known throughout your career, but tell us a little bit more about taking photos of Martin Luther King Jr. You know, for, for those of us who are slightly younger than you, you know, Martin Luther King has always been just an icon, right? Yeah. It, what, what was it like to be there in the moment to take his picture? It was my assignment. <laughs> Jason, I'm raising my rates. <laughs> At that time, I didn't know much about Martin Luther King, except that what he did, you know, and I, I was not involved with him. And so he was just a, another name that who's, where I went because, to take pictures. And Louis Armstrong on the stage, same difference, you know. I was there, got some marvelous pictures of Louis. Uh, uh, and the people met there, uh, I was there too because of Carol Fit. Right. And uh, it, I enjoyed it very much, I was able to talk to these people. And uh, I think because I was able to talk to these people, when on the river, uh, Bob Kennedy came along and took four trips with me on the, river, on, the, on the rivers out there. And I was more their age, I had no problem talking to them even though they were celebrities. So I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it must be time to talk about the river since you, uh, <laughs> since you brought it up. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting, isn't it, that he calls Bobby Kennedy Bob? You normally think of it like when you're close to someone, you call them by their diminutive, but it's the other way for George and, and uh, the dearly departed Bob Kennedy. Uh, so when people think of recreation here in Iowa, we longtime <laughs> Iowans, whitewater rafting isn't really very high on the list. Tell us how you got involved with that. When I started out there, nobody had heard of whitewater rafting because there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And uh, anyway, I was going out into Estes Park one day in my summer vacations from Coe, and 
Uh, I met a friend out there that I'd seen a couple of times before, and they said, have you ever been on a trip, whitewater raft trip? And I said, no. He said, well, we took a trip with Hatch last year and said that uh, it was one of the most enjoyable trips we ever had. I said, so they went out to their house and saw this a river trip that taken by them in the last year. And I thought, that looks interesting. So I roamed around the top of the mountains out there in the Rocky Mountains for two or three days. Then I stopped in Vernal Ustall, knocked on this ramshackle tank house built before anybody knew about building. And anyway, knocked on the door and see, to see if they had a trip going down. And they did have one going down in a couple of days and there was room on it. And so I went. And fortunately, we had good boatmen there. And uh, so I saw, saw a little bit of running the rivers. However, having spent a lot, a lot of time in Lake Okavoja, I still know what, knew what oar to pull on to turn the boat. And these are rafts built in World, World War II as pontoon bridge type of things. Uh, but it, it, uh, as Stefan, these pontoon bridges or, or rafts were 27 foot long, and you filled them in neoprene raft with air, you tied them together, you let them float. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a moment he might continue talking while drinking from the, but that's a different act. Come back. Uh, anyway, you, you float out into the river, and then you tie them together, they co come across the river, tie them off to the other side, you would put boards on them, you had a bridge. And uh, so that's, and then they built their own bridges for the, after the war, and these rafts became available, and so consequently, we found a safe way to go down the river rather than making your own wooden boat. And uh, so, so anyway, we wore out the ones from World War II, and then we're, when they wore out, we tried something that was 33, four, 30, 33 feet long, and it was what they used over in the Pacific as an auxiliary landing craft, but they were 33 feet long, and it got almost too big to handle in wind and so forth. But anyway, we used those two, and then they started building rubber rafts because boating became quite a thing to do uh, out in the West and, and still is, by the way. If you get a chance, uh, and it's changed a lot since, since I did it, because now it's kind of like going to a five-star hotel on the river. But back when I did, we carried our food and our water and our outhouses and, and the whole thing and went down the river. And by the way, a six-day trip at that time cost me $56 to give you an idea. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, had a great time doing it, and as I say, I did it for 45 years. Retired in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understood it the other day when we were talking, you became a boatman largely simply by announcing that you wanted to be a, a boatman. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I, it, the, well, in fact, when I came home, I, I'd taken a movie when I went down the first time because being a photographer. Uh, and. I took the movie on my first trip down, and I thought it was great. And I said, you know, when I got home, I said, I'd like to do that. So I, I wrote Hatch a letter, and I said, you know, this is something that I would like to do. And can I come out next year and be a boatman? And I got a letter back from him and say, I think we've got enough boatmen now. But so I wrote him another letter. I said, maybe how about if I came out and, and took another movie? And I got a letter back from him and said, I think we can use you now, and we have enough things that we can be a river guide. So I went out and I was a river guide. And so I put in passengers on my boat, I just didn't tell them. This was my first trip down. Yes. Yes, I am. I had, had a wonderful time, covered about 25,000 river miles during that time. Met a lot of wonderful people and uh, uh, some marvelous people uh, from various countries, some of the, the elite people would come over and take the boat ride. Uh, one time we had a lady come over. She was brought up in South America. And it was uh, the envoy to the United States from someplace. I don't remember where. But she'd never done any camping or hiking or any of this stuff. And she came with two other ladies from Washington, D.C. And these ladies also wondered how she would do. Well, anyway, uh, they went, and this gal, in the morning, she'd sit down on the riverbank, sometimes a very muddy riverbank, 
with all her perforations in front of her. And then go through her, getting up like she would do back where she was. She had all her beauty aids and so forth in front of her and, and used them all and just had an absolutely wonderful time. Just, just part of the group. And the funny part of it is uh, they promised that uh, they, would, they would come and be her, this lady from wherever, guest, if they would go, she, she would go in the river with them. So and said, the nicest part of it, I had now go, go to where I was. And so she arranged to be on the river and then they, they, had, they, then they had to reciprocate and go back to the uh, um, wherever. <laughs> <laughs> So it is a, this is hard to believe. It, it's the 50th anniversary year of the assassination of, of your friend Bob Kennedy. Tell us, tell us, the Kennedys. I, I think still sort of exist in this country as the closest thing we have to sort of a royal family. Uh, tell us what it was like to be in their presence and to take them down the river. Uh, well, I became very close friends with uh, Bob and Ethel, and uh, when she was now. I'd just taken the Kennedys down the middle fork of the salmon. And anyway, at that time, Bob Kennedy was coming through Cedar Rapids to help campaign for John Culver. And anyway, they went through Marion. And uh, so I looked to see what the situation would be and how they'd get there. I happened to be right for once. And anyway, it was standing by the sidewalk that they came up. And so as they came up along the walk, well, Bob was, yeah, I've got a wonderful picture of that. All these hands were coming out to try to touch Bob. And I've got a picture of that. It's a marvelous picture, by the way. And anyway, um, when he got to me, I said, George Henry from the Middle Fork of the Salmon. And anyway, he, all of a sudden he stopped. And this was the first year, I, or the last year I ever shaved my beard off. <laughs> uh, anyway, just a little thing, he said, just a motion of the hand or something, he said, hey, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you, uh, but you did have a beard on the last time I saw you. And anyway, so we, the uh, uh, National Guard was getting people out of the roads to get the pass to the rostrum, and then the pass to the rostrum, well, uh, the, um, they, they looked around, and Bob Kennedy was standing back there talking to me. <laughs> And so they made their way back to him and got the corp path cleared again. And, and anyway, and he uh, campaigned for Dunn Culver at that time, who was Senate. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit about photography itself. I, I, you know, I, I've seen all these wonderful pictures that you've referenced. And I think about how today, when we take photos with our phone and we get to see what they look like right away and we can make our lips like this so that we look good in the picture. How did you know, back in the day, how did you know when you had the shot? What did you do to make sure you knew you had well, the shot? Well, fortunately, I have a pretty good eye for uh, where, what's important in the picture and how to focus it and where to put it and the rest of that stuff. That's just one of the things that was born in me, I think. But anyway, uh, I just locate myself where I thought the picture would be and, and uh, uh, I, can, I, can, I can take pictures at a, when these uh, people came to talk and so forth, and I was there to take pictures of them, I, I sh you completely shut out everything else, and uh, and shut it out everything else. You you know that they're they're either giving a good talk or a bad talk, but you don't have any idea what they said. But you because you were looking at their actions, you wanted to express it with their hands and so forth to make a good picture. And so consequently, my attentions were not on what they were saying, but how they were acting. Okay. So I just said that I've had the opportunity to see some of your photos. Everyone can see some of your photos. In a, is the exhibit open? When does the exhibit at Cottage Grove open? Uh, I'm just in the process of putting so up something in Cottage Grove. That's where I live now. Way too small. But I still own the house on Grand Avenue where I'm still doing framing work. But anyway, um, the, they wanted me to see if I could get some sort of an uh, exhibit there, and I said, well, I suppose so. So anyway, I've take, got, taken some of my best pictures and fr framed them, matted them, and so forth, 
and probably within, within a week or so, uh, the exhibit is going to be up at Cottage Grove, and it's going to be, if you want to like the pictures, look at it. If you want to buy it, buy it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, and, so that will be at Cottage Grove Place, not far from Washington High School, yeah. uh, across from the gated community there. So. Mm -hmm. And I might men mention that Cottage Grove Place loves to have people like you just stop in and look at the facilities because they're also trying to sell small areas of room. <laughs> George's photos will be slightly cheaper than what the organization is trying to sell, just so you budget appropriately. All right, so that should be up in a couple of weeks. How long do you think it'll be up? Until it's taken down, I have no idea. <laughs> they don't know exactly what it's gonna be putting up, but they're working on it, and I talked to the gal this morning, uh, and she was going to, she, I said, well, when, is this, when are we going, to, kind of clearing the pictures and stuff off the wall of a recreation uh, place up there. It's where people meet and greet and do things like woodwork and jigsaw puzzles and so forth. They're going to take everything off the wall and give me the entire space. And so I'm working to fill the entire space. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, uh, within, I would say, within, maybe I guess, uh, probably maybe a week from, week from now, it'll, the exhibit will be up. And anyway, as I say, I'd be glad to, if you go into Cottage Grove Place, uh, I think you probably all know where it is, but if you don't, it's on uh, First Avenue, you get there First Avenue, turn at the stoplight, it turns up towards Washington High School, and you pass by uh, Cottage Grove Place. And uh, they can certainly tell you where anything is at the front desk there. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got two more questions before we'll turn it over to the assembled crowd. Here's the first one. What story did you want to tell that you haven't told yet? Ask me something. <laughs> All right, then I will go to my, uh, my more difficult question. If someone came to you and said, George, we have space for one of your photos and we want to sum up your career with your favorite of your photos, what would you point them toward? I'd say, I happen to have 100 favorites. Which one would you like to see? <laughs> you are hard to pin down, sir. <laughs> but Louis Armstrong has won awards uh, in national competition where he's standing there with his phone, his horn at his side and his wife at his brow. Give, have given those to many, many silent auctions. They, they seem to want to be one of the best sellers uh, in a silent auction and uh, have made quite a bit of money for a number of people that, when I, when I say a lot of money, I don't mean a lot of money, but they, they often bid higher than I would sell it for. <laughs> so, but at present I have uh, taken one and, and done, and I'm moving my prices up just a little bit now. <laughs> Can they get a deal if they tell you they were here? What? <laughs> I'm trying to help the audience out on your pricing oh, okay. scheme. Like I can tell, you can tell us mine because I'm the only photographer there. <laughs> Fair enough. Mark, what have I forgotten to ask him? Oh my gosh, George, I've had the honor to work on several books with you, uh, and you've been kind enough to work with the History Center over the years on several exhibits uh, on the uh, Cedar Rapids uh, with the History Center and then you as author. And uh, it was an honor to collaborate with you on Then and Now, Cedar Rapids. And uh, I think, did you have any trepidation about doing that book? Uh, because it required you and me to kind of look over our wonderful History Center collection, pick out the best historic photographs, and then it was your duty to go out there and shoot uh, comparatively. So you could take an old site in Cedar Rapids, and then George would go out and photograph the exact same site uh, and shoot the same a shot as it would have been shot 75, 100, 150 years ago. And you repeatedly told me stories about how to get the right shot. You sometimes had to stand in the middle of First Avenue or some other street in Cedar Rapids. And uh, I don't think that bothered you too much, though, did it? It didn't bother me at all because normally I had police all around me saying, what are you doing here? <laughs> 
you you've never been arrested for any of your photography activities uh, in Cedar Rapids at all. But anyway, Mark and I did three books on Cedar Rapids, and uh, Mark knows Cedar Rapids like the back of his hand, and so he taught me all about Cedar Rapids and where the pictures that. Well, I was asked that I was by a telephone sort of call from this book uh, publishing company, Arcadia, said, can you do this? I said, I don't know. I'll go down to the History Center and see what they have in the way of old pictures. Went down there and they had a lot of old pictures. And so uh, I said, I called them back up and said, yes, I can do it. And so anyway, I didn't know it was Mark that was in charge. I just had the History Center at the, as a basis of the, of the of book. But anyway, so, but Mark would tell me where the pictures would be and, and the address pretty much. And so I'd go out and take my camera there and set it a, on a tripod and look at the picture that I was taking and move it three feet one way or other or forward or backward and maybe change the lens from the same perspective and so forth that was taken by bailiffs back in the early 1900s. And I also feel very, very honored to be categorized in, in the, like the person of Bales, who was a previous uh, photographer of old, old Cedar Rapids. And uh, so uh, just to be connect, connected with him and so forth, and thinking that I'm doing some of that for Cedar Rapids now uh, is, is a very much of an honor. Thank you. Yep. And just remind everybody, the beauty of everyone here is that they can go upstairs and see the snapshots by Bayless exhibit, then they can come and see your pictures. It's a win-win. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a great experience for everyone. Uh, one last question I have is uh, certainly we mentioned the people that made this happen for you, Carolyn Schmidt, of course, kind of important for you. Any other inspirations in your life that made this happen for you? Things like this just seem to happen. I mean, they, they do, and it's... And it's You'd be amazed how many times something has happened that, uh, that I had not expected and they just all of a sudden happened that something that I might not have thought of that I'd like to do. Uh, and when I married Kay, uh, she, she took me on trips uh, around the world pretty much. Again, I had a chance to shoot uh, safari trips with wild animals and, and uh, the, uh, I might, might mention something else here. I, I have a little cross here. It is uh, I, up at, we, she had a cabin up at uh, Lake Vermilion, and we'd spend the summer there in a little church in the town of Tower. And anyway, um, the lake itself is a big lake. It's 35 miles long, and with 360 islands in it. But it used to be a, a, a place where they would harvest logs, and so consequently they'd use the water to get the logs from one place to another. And the process of getting one place or another, occasionally a log would sink to the bottom of the, of the lake. Well, 100 to 150 or later, years later, some of those logs came to the surface of the of this, uh, lake, and as a, known as a deadhead. This is the log, and this is what how much showed. And they were very, very detrimental to the boats because they were very hard to see, and the, the log would always win. So anyway, we had this pastor up there thought, maybe those, he, when he'd see one, he'd hold it out of the lake and let it dry a little. And I thought, because I thought maybe in that they had been under the water for so long that they uh, might be good for furniture. Well, anyway, he dried, let them dry a little while and then had somebody cut into them and, and they said, nope, no good for furniture. And so he said, about two weeks later, he was on the internet talking to somebody in, in, on the East Coast. And that person was advertising little, little crosses like this. Uh, you'd go down to the lumber yard and get scraps of wood, come back and make the crosses, and, and, uh, and then sell them to, on the internet. And so, Pastor Bill, uh, who was a, uh, very interesting, he was heavy and so forth, but he loved people, and uh, so he just put a basket of these crosses out in the, the little church, um, uh, St. James Protestant Church, and said, anybody that would like a cross, help themselves. Well, they did, 
And uh, I was going to a convention or, uh, down in, or I was heading for South Africa at the time. And um, I was sitting with Bill, having Bill, ha with breakfast with Bill and a little group of men that meet on eight o'clock in the morning. That's way too early, by the way. But anyway, I was there. <laughs> And I was eating breakfast and sitting next to Bill, and he was saying about he was going to this Rotary Convention down in San Antonio or something, and he said he was going to supply all the Rotarians down there with one of these second chance crosses. Because he, he said the, the uh, cross went down, the tree went down, and you become have to be useful again, and now we have, it gave the tree a second chance, and the so the people, they think, is get this cross and get one, one, or wear one, or get one, uh, have a second chance. And anyway, we, so I went down to South America, and, uh, and I said, well, can you furnish me some of these crosses, Bill? And Bill said, how many do you want? And he was kind of skeptical of how many is a lot. <laughs> but anyway, he gave us 350 crosses, all packaged in a little thing with the, with the deadheads and so forth and what they came and that there were second chance crosses and so forth. And anyway, as we uh, landed down there in the middle of Africa, and uh, there's a three-story airport, and some of the porters there carry bags for uh, the, uh, the passengers and get, expect to get a tip or something. Well, I had just gotten off the boat, so to speak. And anyway, we called it an airplane. Uh, the, and I didn't have anything in my pocket. I don't have no money. I, had, I said, skeptically, I told him, he said, would you like this? And the guy took it and thanked me and, and didn't think much more about it until I went down to the first floor where the airplanes come in. And all of a sudden, as I got off the elevator, here comes, comes this porter and about 10 porters behind me. <laughs> could, you, could they have a cross? And I said, well, Yes, I don't have, a, I was wearing pants with pockets down here and so forth. I carried, was carrying about seven or eight of them. And I said, well, sure. And I passed out what I had. And I said, now that I've got more in my suitcase, so when I come by again, just come out to me and I'll have a cross for you. Which they did and I did. And, and at that time, we got the feel and loved going to, being in Africa because the people down there loved to get those crosses more than they got money. I mean, they would rather, much rather have a cross than money and which was a revelation to us. I thought maybe the people, little kids come beside the bus and want handouts, you know. That was not what we were. But anyway, they turned out to be the salvation, not the salvation, but just an addition to our trip. And we loved it, and we loved the people down there, and we gave them to air, policemen, uh, dog catchers, uh, passport people that took the <laughs> maids, and a anybody that looked like they might, except the cross, and they did, and they loved them, and uh, thanked us for them, and we went to the, when I say we were at the uh, uh, Wildlife Reserve, it's a national, it was a national park, and we were on safari out there, and where I got some marvelous animal pictures, by the way, um, but anyway, uh, when we when got back in the evening, I thought, I wonder if the people that work here and there were probably 25 of them or so, uh, would be interested in these crosses. Could we give them to them? And the management said, yes, that'll be fine. Just give me the crosses. I will supply these people with our help with them. Well, that night we were at dinner, and in comes a string of employees, all wearing their crosses. They sang and they danced for us, and, and they were having a wonderful time, all wearing their crosses. <laughs> no. All right, now, it may seem that we've exhausted all the possible stories, <laughs> <laughs> but we have not. <laughs> questions? I had a couple of observations and a couple of questions. Sure. Is, uh, you spoke of ROTC at Cole. Yes. Mandatory. My father was the uh, editor of the Cole College newspaper. In the I'm sure I knew him. No, probably not, because this was around 1930. And, oh, and I, didn't, I wasn't there yet. <laughs> what? I wasn't there yet. <laughs> no, I know. But he got in trouble for coming out with an editorial uh, opposed to mandatory ROTC. And the college did not like that very well. They wouldn't. And uh, 
So he got in a lot of trouble for that. The other thing is my great-grandfather was a photographer in Cedar Rapids and owned the Swem Cottage Gallery uh, long before your time. Again, he died in 1918, but uh, I just thought that was interesting. Well, it is. Uh, the question, one is, do you know where Washington High School was in 1948 yes. where my mother graduated? Yes. Where was it? It was down by the tracks. No, it was right here. Oh. Oh, well, this is where we are, yes. <laughs> that is where we are. So Washington High School, my, my alma mater, though, right. not that right. building. <laughs> the question I have is, my, my great aunt was the dean of women at Coe in the early 1950s. Uh, her name was Alice Salter. Who her? Did you know her? Yes. I have a picture of her that I got from the archives, and I wondered if you could look at it later and tell me if you took the picture. No, I don't. I don't think I know the picture you have reference to. I think, but I did not have. I did take pictures of her, but let me see the picture. I will after. The, I don't want to hold up. There. Okay. All right. Now I'm supposed to repeat the questions for the for the sake of the recording. So go ahead, George. Um, there's a story about when you and the navigator threw the bomber for repairs, and uh, I think you had to fly from Europe to England, and uh, uh, it was an interesting experience for the navigator, if I recall. I, I am missing a little of what he said. So it's a question about having to fly a plane for repairs, you and a navigator. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting story. Uh, I, this is when, when I was over there and, and flying, and I didn't have to fly that day, and I was able to go into town, and, and if you're over in town, you just stood on the side of the road, and a, a truck or a tank or anything else going by would pick you up and take you in. But anyway, I, it was before I got a chance to go into town, well, I had to be strolling around the, the campus, mud floors, no, you know, wet and so forth, but anyway, Somebody came up and said, would you take a place over to Foggia where we have a repair depot? He said the landing gear had collapsed on the landing and so they needed somebody to repair it. And he said, we've got it wired, wired open, but it should take another landing and so forth. And anyway, um, I said, sure. Well, anyway, I had, you needed a co-pilot to fly these things. And so I, they found somebody else there uh, on the street and uh, as my as engineer to go along and and when I could forgot something and he'd tell me I was doing something, I might regress just a moment because we landed the V twenty four at one hundred and twenty miles an hour, and the um, after basically after most of my training in a V twenty four, I was coming in for a landing, and I had a high speed stall at one hundred and twenty miles an hour. I said, that's the last time I ever land an air, a V-24 at 120 miles an hour. And so I may be, have been the only person in World War II that landed a V-24 at 140 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I also discovered if you, if you uh, dive the airplane with the fl full flaps on, you can't get over 140 miles an hour. And anyway, I was coming in for a landing. You don't have any height areas over there anyway. So at Foggia, I eyeballed the ground and flew around the pattern and went to land and discovered I was way high. Now, at first it had never flown with me before. It never landed at 140 miles an hour. It was there telling me what to do. And anyway, he. The co-pilot seat was empty, and my, I was sitting over here in the pilot seat, seat and he, he, he had his knuckles on the back of the chairs. And as we started down at about this angle, towards the ground, with no power, and I cut the power back, cut it off into a glide uh, area, and got down, and this guy was saying, 100, 140, 140. And I, I knew exactly what he was thinking, and I didn't have time to talk to him. <laughs> but anyway, we got down near the ground, I put the power back on, brought the nose up, one of the prettiest landings I ever made in my life. But as we got to the end of the runway, 
I got bomb days, made doors open, and my engineer disappeared. Uh, I'm sure he got a story about this goofy pilot that, 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 that he escaped the, from the airplane from, and that, that, that he's probably, I'm sure he didn't live through the war. <laughs> All right, another question. It's over here. Uh, thank you all for being here. And I'm curious, has anyone put a video together of all of your photos? Ah, uh, is there a video of all of your photos? Uh, there is no such thing as, a, as pictures of all of my photos. Uh, uh, as I say, I'm just going through some old photos now. And uh, Monument Valley was mentioned as, that my friend and I went out for the book. and. Uh, the, um, the, 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 I was down there and I had some old negatives and I looked at them, they were the Kennedy negatives and also old negatives that I have and started looking at them. Here was Mon Monument Valley pictures that I'd gone down in 1950. And I pulled them out and here was the puddles of water on the road and the, and the Harry Gouley's place up on the, on the hill and the, the Indians out Take driving their sheep to water, which I I'd forgotten I didn't have any exhibit. And, and by the way, my photo department, Photo Pro, bends over backwards to take care of the people that deal with Photo Pro. They're out in, in Lindale Mall. But anyway, they do, they've got two girls in there, and when they quit, I, they, I'm going to be quitting as a photographer because they just bend over backwards, do the, do the work that I want done, and do it right. And if I don't like it, they do it over. And anyway, I just love them and they love me and it, it's a great combination. But anyway, I took a, a couple of those Navajo pictures of, that I'm gonna have the exhibit that I had to make uh, 16 by 20 pictures of. I picked them up yesterday and uh, they're gonna be, because they're history, you, you don't see this anymore and uh, and here's Harry Gooley, the person that, Harry, that the homesteaded out there uh, in Monument Valley, standing up on the railing, you look out into the valley, and you know, you look at those things and you think, this is history, and it doesn't happen anymore, it's not there anymore. Yeah. But anyway, I've had a wonderful time getting old with it. <laughs> <laughs> now there is a DVD that traces George's career. Can you talk a little bit about the, the film that they made about your career? Um, I've had a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it started at Co. when I started doing it there. And just, I've been, I, I started out, I, I took pictures of everything. I took pictures of the kids and weddings and, and uh, in house interiors and anything else that anybody wanted me to do. And uh, I went to, uh, in, that I had never operated a four by five camera in my life. I went out to a place out in Winona, Indiana, to the school for professionals. And when I was out there, well, uh, professionals came over in from around the United States and taught these courses. And anyway, so I got my first experience with a four by five camera and a film carrier that I had never put a piece of film in. And so I just went ahead and did it and, and learned how from the experts out there, they had different phases of action and uh, fashion and a lot of the things. And so I learned from that that there were little weak courses or two weak courses. And uh, I think I went out there three or four times, learned what I didn't know forgot most of it, but used, used the things I did know uh, to earn a living with, and then have enjoyed that very much. You want to talk a little bit about the film? Oh, uh, yeah. then the, the title of the George is very appropriate, 80 Years. Yes, 80 Through Through the Lens, yes. Lens, By the way, if you want to see that, I think the library has a copy of it downstairs. Oh, the library here does Yeah, right here. So, uh, check it out. Okay, check it out. Do we have another question at this time? Mike? <coughs> George, you ought to talk about your experience with bears. My what? Your experience with bears. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on, we've got Anyway, in the summer, uh, there's a bear sanctuary about 100 miles from us, or 50 miles, exactly 50 miles from us there, where we, up at Lake Vermilion. And they have a bear sanctuary. And in the bear sanctuary, 
had no water, no electricity, uh, no in-houses, so to speak, uh, and everything was very rustic, and they had no cook. So once a week, Kay and I would fix a, a dinner for them and take it up to them, and, and so they would have a, a good, one good, at least one good meal a week. And so we would do that, we'd get the, the food up there, and when Kay, Edwin would go up there, well, Kay would feed the people inside, and I would go outside and not feed the bears. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I, so I got to be out with the bears and take some marvelous bear pictures uh, up there at Lake Vermilion on the bear sanctuary. Uh, and, and it goes on yet, and I still, we didn't, didn't get out to the bear sanctuary last year because we had a little problem. But anyway, not because of the bears, but because of us. But we hope to get up there this year and maybe get another chance to go see the bears. Maybe take some more pictures. <laughs> there you go. All right, now, as we said at the beginning, I work at Hancher, and one of the things I've learned in my time at Hancher is that you should always listen to the stage manager, or they will call you by your full name. And the stage manager for this evening has given me the one more question sign, so I think we're gonna go right sure. there. Yeah. How much of your work through the years has been black and white photography versus color photography? So how much uh, did you shoot in black and white versus how much have you shot in color? The, up to about the year 2000, everything was black and white. And why was everything black and white? Because color took, it was very expensive to get color pictures. And the only people that I knew around at that time that did it was National Geographic. And they had marvelous coverage and marvelous photographers. And they did the, the put three colors together to come out with what they, what they, they thought they saw, and there was no way to correct it before you saw the picture, so the consequently, they, they'd make a good guess, put it together, and if it was too blue or too red or too yellow, they would have to go and redo it again, taking into what they just learned. Sometimes take up to three or four times to take a picture and, and to print it. So consequently, very time excessive, and, uh, and then you had to print it in the book. It also cost a tremendous amount of money to get color into a, a book or so forth. So consequently, up to about 1900 or 2000, I'm back a little bit around 1900. Uh, but anyway, uh, at 2000, well, the, uh, the digital came in and, and things started going back to away from film and into digital photography. And, uh, it, uh, and of course, the way of doing photography changed completely. I'm still using a camera that uses film, by the way. Uh, and I, I could get it developed at PhotoPro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, on behalf of the History Center and also just on behalf did of- Did I the, answer the question that somebody- You did answer that, yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> we, are, we are very honored that you were the uh, first person of this new project, the Oral History Live project for the History Center. I'm sure all of you already know this, but the History Center is an essential organization in this community that will be reopening a permanent facility in the Douglas Mansion this fall. They are worthy of your ongoing attendance and support, even if you don't like Jason Wright, which I, you know, I can, I can understand. Uh, so, with that, thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, we'll see you. Next week.